Good morning to those of you who are joining us here today and those of you who are joining us online for this view on Africa coming to you from the Institute for Security Studies Pretoria. I am Fonte Akum, Senior Researcher in the Peace and Security Research Program, where my research focuses on the political economy of governance, security and peace dynamics in the Central Africa region. Today, we are going to be preoccupied with understanding whether Congo Brazzaville is building a fractured new republic. This is the second VOA in our continuing research engagement with the political development in Congo Brazzaville. And this is not to be mistaken with its much larger and 20 times more populated eastern and southern neighbor across the river, the Democratic Republic of Congo. We could not stress more the urgency of focusing on Congo Brazzaville at this time. Not only because the country is in the grips of a war which has generated a humanitarian crisis and continues to have devastating effects on food security, but also the fact that at the end of this month, citizens would be once again called to vote in a senatorial election. But also because, the uncertain, because of the uncertainty which continues across the river in the DRC. All, this, all these point to the urgency for dealing with Congo Brazzaville at this time. So today we would draw some analytical insights from the July 2017 legislative elections in Congo Brazzaville which just ended and explore their implications for governance, peace and security. We would, I mean, and for those of you who are very tuned in to ISS, we have a synaptic narrative equally available on our website under the rubric ISS Today. So this presentation would have three parts. We would start off with a very brief background to trace the dynamics leading up to where we are today in the current crisis situation in Congo Brazzaville. Then we would do an overview of the two rounds of voting, showing you what the results represent and trying to understand what they mean. And then we would look at the governance implications of the legislative elections. All of this should take approximately 15 minutes, after which I would be glad to respond to your online questions and comments and for, to questions coming from the audience here as well. Now, as a brief background, for those of you who tuned in to our last view on Africa and Congo Brazzaville, which is still archived on our website, www.issafrica.org, we dealt extensively with the 2015 constitutional referendum and its socio-political socio implications. Suffice it to say at this time that the very contested referendum set in motion an institutional reformation which supporters of the governing agenda packaged as the construction of a new republic. The centerpiece of this institutional reform included changes to presidential age limits where the upper limit for the presidency was lifted, which was normally 70 years old, it changed term limits from seven to five years, a reduction of two years, and it expanded term limit from two to three terms, paving the way for President Denis Sassou Nguesso's re-election in even more divisive presidential elections in March 2016. With a new constitution and Sassou Nguesso's re-election, the challenge turned to organizing local parliamentary and senatorial elections to complete the institutional setup of Sassou Nguesso's pet project, the New Republic, which we have in quotes. The unrest that characterized the constitutional referendum and presidential elections triggered and exacerbated three interconnected crises, which we will talk about. And these crises basically created the backdrop against which the twin legislative and local elections were taking place in July. Now, going back to the interconnected crisis, the first one is the political crisis triggered by the constitutional referendum in November 2015 and worsened by contested results of the March 2016 presidential elections. This has resulted in a fractured political landscape 
where the state has increasingly relied on coercive rather than consensual governance. And this is evidenced by the incarceration of former presidential candidates and their aides, and the reliance on state security apparatus to clamp down on social movements and civil society organizations. The second dimension of this crisis is economic. Congo is still reeling from an economic crisis set off by the collapse in oil prices in 2014. Its ripple effects have been felt in communities, private and public enterprise sectors, with the economic capital of Pointe Noire feeling the brunt of the crisis, resulting in growing social discontent. The third crisis is that of social violence. So criminality by youth gangs called the Bebe Noir, or in English, Black Babies, and vigilante groups known as Les Sept Apotres, or the Seven Apostles, stoked different forms of social violence, creating unrest in the capital city and its environs. Now, a manifest security threat also materialized in the immediate aftermath of the 2016 presidential elections, when the Ninja Militia Group recomposed itself. This is a group which had fought the government in a civil war from 1997 to 2003. And after its recomposition, it attacked government infrastructure in Brazzaville's southern district in the immediate aftermath of those presidential elections. This security situation has resulted in an ongoing war in the Pool region, described as an opaque war, and we would explain that later. Importantly, this equatorial region, Pool, which is Congo's breadbasket, has been subject to a government pacification mission meant to arrest Ninja militia leader Frédéric Mbinsamou, alias Pastor Ntumi, and eliminate the group, which is considered a threat to state security. According to United Nations and government reports, this 17-month-long war, whose theater remains largely close to humanitarian agencies, therefore earning itself the moniker, the opaque war, has resulted in over 81,000 internally displaced persons as of July this year. And if we consider that the total population of Congo Brazzaville is 4.5 million, we can see the vast extent of the humanitarian crisis. The number of civilian casualties, however, remains unknown given that the area is still closed to humanitarian agencies. This three crises, in brief, present the backdrop against which the first and second round of voting for the legislative elections took place on July 16th and 30th, respectively. To summarize the crisis again, we are looking at a country with a political crisis that has seen opposition candidates thrown in jail, a war which is ravaging the country's farming heartland, and strong economic headwinds due to the country's over-reliance on oil markets and other natural resource exploitation. So, let's move on to the second part of the presentation after this background to look at the two rounds of voting. Stakes were high for all parties involved. The government was trying to consolidate its plan to restore a one-party state underneath a cosmetic veneer of democracy. Meanwhile, opposition groups, some of which were vying for the coveted title of official leader of the opposition, which was institutionalized in the last constitution, uh, were splintered, as with some deciding to participate in the elections, with others deciding to boycott. The parties of two former presidential candidates from the 2016 presidential elections, Pascal Tsatsi Mabialas, UPADES, and Guy Brice Parfait Colelas, UDH Yuki, opted to participate in these elections. And for those who don't know these organizations, UPADES is basically the Pan African Union of, for Social Democracy, while UDH is the Union for Humanist Democrats. Two other opposition political platforms, IDC Frocat CG3M, led by Claudine Monari, opted against participation and calling for a boycott for different reasons, including the ongoing war in the Pool region and the arrest of two of the political candidates who are members of this platform. Meanwhile, Matthias Zong's 
oppos Congolese Opposition Party Collective opted for a more procedural boycott, given that a census which was supposed to have been conducted prior to the change in number of seats for parliament was not conducted. Now, we're going to go and look at the results before stepping back again to the process of, through which the elections took place. Unsurprisingly, uh, the ruling Congolese Labour Party, also known as the Parti Congolais du Travail, or PCT, won 91 of the 151 seats. Leading opposition parties which opted to participate in the elections, which were the Pan-African Union for so of Social Democracy and the Union of Humanist Democrats, each scored eight seats. The results from both rounds of voting however, remain clouded by the inability of the Independent National Elections Commission to announce official voter turnout rates in what are widely accepted to have been very, very lukewarm participation, and the continuation of an opaque war which prevented voting from taking place in large parts of the Pool region. So voting took place in only seven of the 16 electoral districts in Pool, for example. The electoral participation, however, this is going back to the process, was characterized by boycotts, protests, voting fraud, and violence, raising important questions about an enduring political and economic crisis in the run-up to the senatorial elections. Now that the elections are over, it's important for us to understand Congo Brazzaville's governance trajectory while the ruling Congolese Labour Party, or PCT, won a majority of seats in what was considered to be its traditional strongholds in the northern regions of the country, sporadic pockets of violence against some of the PCT candidates in that region do not bode well for the party. There was, violence opposing P there was also violence opposing PCT-aligned independents and PCT candidates in some districts of Brazzaville during the second round of voting. What may seem here as the show of robust democratization in action is actually evidence of fracture within the re-ruling party, mainly due to a generational battle for the heart and soul of the party. And this intergenerational battle opposes the old guard led by the Secretary General of the party, of the ruling party, Pierre Angolo, and the a political PCT political bureau member and the president's son, Denis Christel Sassongueso, who is widely considered to be the heir apparent. And all this is taking place as the party starts to gear up for the 2021 presidential elections, which is not such a long way away. Meanwhile, other opposition parties, such as the MCDDE, an, um, an opposition party which is strictly aligned to the PCT, lost all seven seats it had gained during the 2012 legislative elections. This in and of itself shows a rejection of the ruling PCT and its allies in the southern district of Brazzaville and in many parts of the south of the country, particularly uh, given the dynamics of fracture which are actually being evidenced. So, Brazzaville continues to be socio-politically fractured as well along pro-government and anti-government lines with the legislative elections providing proof that these fractures are real and entrenched. Individuals known to be aligned with the president's son and heir apparent, Denis Christel Sassongueso, also gained entry into the assembly, creating a cohort of potential political allies to support a battle for the control of the ruling party, PCT, as well as serving as a vehicle for a potential presidential push. Congo's political topography thus evidences clientelistic unipartism to the north and tenuous multipartism to the south of the country. This unipartism is driven by PCT stalwarts and ministers deploying state resources to drive their political campaigns. Meanwhile, attention is turning away from political parties towards social movements such as workers' unions, trade unions, and students' unions to drive the kind of change necessary to generate the renewal of Congo's social and political compact necessary for the country to go on, embark on the road to healing socio-political fractures. All this is taking place against the backdrop 
of a deteriorating multidimensional crisis presented in the earlier background of this uh, presentation. Now, a couple of weeks ago, the International Monetary Fund also announced that Congo's, Congo Brazzaville's debt amounts to 120% of GDP, contrary to the 77% which had been announced in March uh, after an Article 4 consultation in March of this year. While the governing regime increasingly relies on coercive rather than consensual governance to maintain political control, this economic situation continues to erode its ability not just to effectively maintain broad-based authority through coercion as it's done before, but it also affects its war effort in the pool region as soldiers continue, need to, be, continue to fight the war and they need to be paid, and it requires a huge log logistical outlay. Now, the big question that remains in conclusion, and I know we are one minute over 15 minutes, the big question that remains uh, is who would be called upon to make the requisite sacrifices to extricate Congo from this multidimensional crisis. Obviously, there would be winners and losers in trying to find a solution out of this crisis. However, a solution needs to be sought.